Hello and thanks for watching Chunk and Check. In this video we're going to walk through the coagulation cascade step by step. The process has been slightly simplified to make it easier to understand, but this flowchart contains everything you need to know as a medical student. The full resource is available on our website www.chunkandcheck.com and if you like this video please like, share and subscribe. So clotting is triggered by three main factors. Exposed basement collagen, so when your vessel is damaged. Smooth muscle spasm, as the vessel constricts to try to stop the bleeding. And by platelets releasing granules, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So after the vessel is damaged, collagen tissue factor becomes exposed, and this binds to platelets in two ways. Directly by GP1A, and indirectly by GP1B, which you might have heard being called von Willebrand factor. When this binding occurs, the platelets change shape, and as a result they release their granule contents to form a platelet plug. There are two types of granules, dense granules also called delta granules, and non-dense granules also called alpha granules. The dense granules release ADP, ATP, serotonin and calcium, and the non-dense granules release glycoproteins, von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen, and all the coagulation factors which feed into the coagulation cascade. It's worth mentioning von Willebrand disease here, which is the commonest inherited bleeding disorder affecting about 1 in 1000 people. In this disease there is a reduced amount of von Willebrand factor which leads to increased bleeding, and the bleeding seen in this condition is usually mucosal bleeding, so bleeding gums and nosebleeds are usually seen, along with some easy bruising. So back to the tissue factor, once platelets have bound, tissue factor binds to factor 7 and activates it. Activated factor 7 activates factor 10. Activated factor 10 activates factor 2. You might have heard this being called thrombin, so activated factor 10 converts prothrombin to thrombin. And after a small amount of thrombin is produced, other factors are activated which feed back into the pathway to produce more thrombin. And this is known as a thrombin burst. So while factor 8 and 9 have popped up, let's pause here to talk about haemophilia. Similarly to von Willebrand disease, this is also an inherited clotting disorder. It is X-linked recessive, meaning only boys are affected, and you can't generate a thrombin burst, meaning you make a rubbish clot. In haemophilia A, factor 8 isn't expressed, and in haemophilia B, factor 9 isn't expressed. Type A's are most common, affecting 1 in 5,000 male births. So, back to thrombin. This also activates factor 5 which feeds back into the system to increase the amount of thrombin further. Thrombin also converts fibrinogen to fibrin monomers and activated factor 13 crosslinks these fibres to form a fibrin polymer which is your fully formed stabilised blood clot. So clinically this process is divided into three parts which can be tested to see which part of the process is missing in the event of a clotting disorder. The first is the extrinsic pathway which is assessed by measuring prothrombin time and includes factor 7. The intrinsic pathway is assessed by activated partial thromboplasmin time and includes factor 8, 9, 10 and 11 and indirectly von Willebrand factor which binds to factor 8 to increase its half-life. And the final common pathway is assessed by thrombin time and includes factor 2 which is thrombin and factor 5. So let's talk about the factors which balance this process now. On one side of the balance you have procoagulation factors, which include the endothelial surface, platelets, von Willebrand factor and all the coagulation factors that we've mentioned so far. Counteracting this there are natural anticoagulants as well as some drugs which combat clotting. Protein S acts as a cofactor for protein C which is activated by thrombin and thrombomodulin on the endothelial cell surface. The body knows that we don't want a clot to last forever, so these proteins are waiting in the wings ready to go. Protein C inactivates factor 5 and factor 8 to slow down the clotting process. Antithrombin also slows down the clotting process and this inhibits factor 9, 10, 11, 12 and thrombin again to slow down the clotting process. Let's look at two of the most common anticoagulant drugs now. Firstly heparin which acts by binding to antithrombin to enhance its effect. You can see how heparin prevents clotting by indirectly inhibiting factors 9, 10, 11, 12 and thrombin. 
Warfarin is the other anticoagulant you'll be familiar with. This is a vitamin K antagonist, so by reducing the amount of available vitamin K, warfarin stops all vitamin K dependent clotting factors from doing their job. And these are 2, 7, 9 and 10, as well as protein C and S. So when the clot has done its job, we have to break it down. This process is called fibrinolysis and is required to limit coagulation and restore blood flow. Thrombin stimulates tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, which cleaves plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin then breaks down the fibrin and removes the clot. So there you have it, that's the coagulation cascade. If you break it down into steps, it can be quite easy to understand what's going on. It's probably a little bit more complicated than this if you look into it in more detail, but this is a good overview. The full resource is available at our website, and if you found this video useful, please like, share and subscribe. See you next time, and thanks for watching.